and we're here to celebrate what the Lord has done for us. The best thing he ever did for us happened at Calvary. Would you stand with me as we're going to sing? Whatever's in your bulletin, just disregard it because I kind of didn't make changes I should have. We're going to start with nothing but the blood. So let's join that together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. pray with me. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. God, thanking you for this time, for this opportunity. God, to worship you. God, to be reminded of your truth. God, to be reminded of your character. To be reminded of your love. God, we thank you for this opportunity. God, to recenter ourselves, God, in, in you. God, to look towards you as we continue to run the race that's set before us. God, we ask that, God, that you would encourage us. God, that your word would speak truth over us. And God, that we would respond. God, we pray for our pastor. God, pray that you would speak through him. God, that our hearts and our ears would be open. God, so that we can hear from you. God, and may our lives reflect obedience to your will and to your truth. God, we thank you for everything you have done. Pray that you continue to lead this church as we continue forward. Pray that we continue to look to you for guidance. God, we ask that, God, that you continue to be a, watch, a watchful person over us. God, we ask that, uh, God, that your love would continue over us. 
We praise you for who you are. And most importantly, we praise you for Jesus, who died on the cross for us. In his most precious name we pray. Amen. back to elementary school? Okay, how about be a star? You can be both. You can become a Starkey star. So what is a Starkey star? A Trinity Baptist Church member who is willing to spend one hour, one day a week for nine months with a student who is in need of a little extra help of reading. Trinity is beginning their eighth year of adoption with Starkey Elementary School and their mentoring program. 
And wow, are there some exciting adventures about to happen. So watch your bulletin for an opportunity for you to serve our church and the neighborhood school. But I'm going to put a little something extra in there because my friend Bob Walker asked me to do. Um, there are other elementary schools in our area also. I know that our church is neighborhoods with, with Starkey, but they live in Ingram, and I will, they are mentoring in Ingram. If you're in an area close to your house that you prefer to mentor at, get involved. I don't, it's, it, mentoring is huge, and it makes such a huge difference in our children's lives. So it doesn't have to be just at Starkey, although I'll, I'll definitely want to take you to Starkey with me. But if you're in a different area, please look into it and mentor there. But you don't just have to be a mentor to be a Starkey star here, though, in church also. You can help out the nurse by bringing items as listed on the front of the bulletin, cut out box tops from different items from the grocery store, and pray. Pray for our school board, our administrators, our teachers, our students, and for each and every one of our mentors. I look forward to seeing some new faces for mentoring and some old faces that have taken a little break. We would love to have you back. Sign-up sheets will be available in the office or just give me a call. Come join in on the Trinity Starkey Fun and be a star. There's nothing like hearing a confident child read. And uh, I know for eight years you've been a part of that. And if you can be a part of that in the future, please get in touch with Jerry or call the church and let us involve you in that way. Today we begin our uh, week of prayer for uh, state missions. And Mary Hill Davis offering is what we're taking up uh, this month. Uh, you have received in your worship guide a prayer guide. And uh, in the prayer guide, there are eight days in there beginning today and we'll be concluding next Sunday. I want to ask if you would take it and pray through those needs with us. Uh, one of the great things is we get a chance to pray as a faith family about the same thing this week. But not only are we praying together as a faith family at Trinity Baptist Church, but we're praying with other Texas Baptists around the state uh, about the same issues and opportunities to see God work in uh, some great ways. So uh, our goal at Trinity Baptist Church is $6,206. And uh, I know that we can surpass that with the work that we've done. And want to just encourage you to consider what you would give to that state offering as uh, we continue to see good things take place. This past week, uh, Wednesday, we began a new schedule. Uh, we had our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer meeting that began at 5.30. Prior to that, we had a meal that was at 4.45, and it was excellent. We had such a great turnout. Uh, if you would like to come and be a part of it, we want to encourage you to come be a part of that with us. Uh, there are children's activities. Wednesday's kids are taking place as well as Saturate for our junior high students at the same time. And then high school starts a little bit afterwards. But there's something going on for everybody on Wednesday night. I hope that you'll find a way to plug in. Tonight we begin our formation classes. There are two classes with our adults that will have Marriage 101. And then also Praying Circles Around Your Fears will be two classes. Op uh, they'll, be op they'll be starting tonight. Also we have our Courageous Kids. I keep calling it Outrageous Kids. But it's Courageous Kids. Uh, who are, They are outrageous but they're great. Uh, but it begins tonight at the 530 as well. As well as our Connect Youth Group meeting that will take place. So lots of ways to plug in. Take advantage of the opportunities that are before you. Also, this Wednesday, for you men and uh, young men in the church, uh, uh, young boys in the church, at 6.30 in the morning, if you're a young boy and you don't have a driver's license, you'll need someone to bring you, or you can ride a bike, I guess. But at 6.30, we have a breakfast that's going to be scheduled. We're going to have a time for six weeks to get together and have something to eat, some coffee, talk about some things, share some thoughts, share some prayers. And then talk about the life of Joseph in the Old Testament. So if you've got time and can come be a part of that, you can call the church office. We've kind of got an idea about what might be coming, but we'd love to know a number. Uh, if you could call and let us know, that would be great. Uh, cost for the breakfast was $3. That's a suggested price, and uh, we'll take care of that. Have a, have a great time for the next six weeks with the men of our church. So come and be a part of that. I want to welcome you. Of course, it's always great to be together as a faith family, as a church. It's so good to be together. And uh, I want to welcome you to our service today. For those of you who are guests of ours, you're not a member of Trinity Baptist Church, we're glad you're here. Uh, in your worship guide, there's a tear-off that we'd love for you to fill out. Tear it off, place it in the offering plate. When it gets passed, we'd love to have a record of your visit with us today. 
Uh, if today's your first time to come, we hope that you'll find your way to the foyer and pick up a gift bag with you as you leave. It has a DVD, some information about Trinity Baptist Church. Uh, we would love to walk along with you, let you know a little bit about us as we learn a little bit about you. And maybe in prayerful hope, we'll find ourselves walking together down the path of faith in the days to come. Uh, but the greatest way we know to say good morning and hello is by shaking hands and looking in each other's eyes. So right now, where you are, would you stand and greet those that are around you? <clears throat> Good morning. How are y'all today? Good. Good to see you. Listen, do y'all know what this is? I brought a jar full of gummy bears with me this morning. This reminds me of when I was a little girl. I went to a birthday party one time, and my friend's mom had a jar bigger than this full of gummy bears. And a game we played at that birthday party was we were supposed to look at the jar and guess how many gummy bears are in there. Does anybody want to guess how many gummy bears are in my jar? Where do you think? How, how many? 40 or 50? Okay. Anybody else want to guess? How many? 60 or 70? Anybody else want to guess? Nobody's gotten close yet. Any other guesses? Eric, have you got a guess? No? Nobody else wants to guess. Okay, should I tell you how many? Okay, it's 117 gummy bears in this jar. It's a lot, huh? Yeah. Wouldn't it be neat if we could just look at a jar full of gummy bears like this and just know how many are in there? Wouldn't it be cool to just go, yeah, there's 117. That'd be, cool. That'd be neat to do, wouldn't it? Do you know God could probably do that, couldn't he? He could probably look at my gummy bear jar and he would know exactly how many are in there because he's God and he knows everything. Do you know what else God knows? God knows you. He knows you so well that he knows exactly how many hairs are on your head. Look around. Some of us have short hair like Brian. Some of us have really long hair like Paige. And some of us out there probably don't have very much hair at all. But, but no matter how much hair we have, God knows exactly how many hairs are on our head. And he doesn't have to count them. He doesn't have to take all day to count them and go one, two, oh, that's how many she has. He just knows. That's how well he knows you. He even knew all about you, who you would be, what you would like, what you would not like before you were even born. God knows you, and he wants to be part of your life. The Bible tells us in the book of Matthew, it says, 
Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Do you know what a sparrow is? It's a little bird. Yet if one of those sparrows falls to the ground apart from the will of God, he knows about it. God knows. So if God even knows when a tiny little bird falls out of the sky, do you think he cares about you even more than that bird? He does. But that's how much God knows and how much God cares about you. So this week, while you're at school or at home or wherever you have to go, I hope you think about that and remember that God knows you and he loves you and he wants to be part of your life. Think about that this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these children, for knowing them, for planning their lives and just just being a part of them, God. And I pray that as they go through their week, that they would take the time to talk to you and pray to you and to invite you to be a part of what they're doing, whether it's at school or home or at play. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pudi Sok. My family came from Cambodia as refugees of the Khmer Rouge. I grew up Buddhist. I really didn't believe in God. And so throughout high school, I started to realize that I was an atheist. So I came to UTA and I really didn't know what, what it would be like living on a university campus. After just a, a couple of days, I met um, a lot of Christians and they invited me to the BSM. I didn't know what the BSM was. I, I knew nothing, had zero knowledge of the gospel. Um, hardly have heard of Jesus. I've just heard of that name before. And I came here and I just loved what the students were doing. Um, I love that they were um, so intentional about meeting other students, uh, about allowing them to have a welcoming good time at you know, at UTA, as well as uh, making a lot of friends here and um, engaging them with conversations about the gospel. Um, and they did that with me. A lot of times we would do ministry by knocking on doors and asking people, um, is it okay if we take out trash for you? And the students would respond, sure, you can take out our trash. And um, they'd also, also ask, well, why are you doing this? And my friends would say, um, well, we're part of the BSM and we just want to show you Christ's love. And I would respond and interject with, my name's Pudi, like, I just want to show you my love. And um, I just thought, you know, that everything that my Christian friends were doing, I could do too. And I didn't need Jesus to do it. After some time, I, I believed uh, that I was just getting really tired. I realized I was getting tired and weary of trying to work up um, to the same standards as them through my own strength. And I remember telling my friend Jared, you know, I, I really want to accept Jesus into my heart. I want to accept that he died on the cross for my sins so that I don't have to live, you know, enslaved to sin, but just um, live freely for him. But I don't really know if I can do that. You know, I hear that, but I'm not sure if I can do that. And I think that was the first time when I totally gave up my will um, for God. I laid aside everything I thought I knew and totally gave up my life to Him. And a couple days later, I started sharing that with people. And I was just very passionate about evangelism, passionate about people who do not know God and um, about people who uh, have never heard about Jesus before. And later, I started discipling younger girls. And um, as I was graduating, I was at a place where I was uncertain about what I wanted to do next. And Gary came up to me and said, Pudi, you know, I think that it would be neat if you joined the BSM as a campus missionary. And um, I think God has helped me just grow so much in my faith as being a campus missionary. And um, I just know for certain, like now, that there's nothing else God wanted me to do except what I'm doing right now. Thank you for giving to the Mary Hill Davis offering for Texas Missions. Because of you giving, I'm able to be a campus missionary and a Christian.
We've heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves. Let's share that sound. Let's stand together as we sing. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, you know us well. You know everything about us. You know our very desires. And today our desires are that our offering is worthy of what you've given us. We give back to you that portion which we deem is good for you and good for us. We know it makes you happy and it makes us happy to give in your name and give to your, to your service. Bless that offering as only you can do, not because of what we want, but because of what you want. And give today all of us a peace, having the knowledge that we've given back to you what we deem is correct and what you have blessed us with. Bless our, this offering we pray in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is to celebrate Grandparents' Day. If I had all the riches this world had to give, all the comfort that it brings, never needing anything, I could search the whole world over far and wide, try to buy this precious love that was sent from God above, but it wouldn't be enough. No, it wouldn't be enough to buy one splinter of the tree that Jesus died on. And I couldn't pay the price for one single drop of blood that was shed for my salvation. If I had all the riches this world had to give, but then I gave it all away, every penny to my name, to some beggar on life's dark and lonely streets, all that kindness found in me could not win eternity, 
And it wouldn't be enough No, it wouldn't be enough To buy one splinter of the tree That Jesus died on And I couldn't pay the price For one single drop of blood That was shed for my salvation And I couldn't be enough No, it wouldn't be enough To buy one splinter of the tree That Jesus died on And I couldn't pay the price For one single drop of blood That was shed for my salvation. How grateful we are for the grace that God brings to us because of His goodness and not because of what we merit. Uh, nothing is enough for what God has done for us other than we can do our best to live a life for him in response. Do you know the difference between a star and a moon? I, I don't claim to be a scientist. I don't claim to have a big degree in a lot of technology and those types of things. What I've learned, I've learned by reading or even looking at the internet uh, to discover, discover the difference between a star and a moon. But a star generates its own energy. A star provides its own light. Uh, a star is the center of its own solar system. Uh, as we stop and think about the closest star to us is our sun. And the sun generates its own light. It generates its own energy. It is the center of its own solar system. Everything revolves around it. That's what a star is. A moon, on the other hand, is quite different. A moon is not anything that generates anything other than it reflects the light of another. So when you see the moon on a, on a clear day, we can look up in the sky, we can see a sun that's generating its light, and we understand that uh, we're so grateful for the heat and warmth that it provides to us. On a clear night, we look at the moon and we recognize it's not generating any light of its own. It's only generating the light that's reflected off of the sun, and that's why the moon has different shapes during different times of the month because sometimes it's a toenail sometimes it's a half moon or three quarters moon or a full moon the difference between a star and a moon if you were asked which one you would rather be if you would you rather be a star or would you rather be a moon most people would rather be a star uh, they would rather be someone who generates their own light who who is the center of their own universe who is responsible for putting light forth and, and responsible in that way. But as children of God, we've not been called to build our own light. We've not been called to generate our own light. We've been called rather to be like a moon, that we reflect the light of something else. And the light that we reflect is not just something else, but it's God himself. Instead of us trying to create ourselves we want to generate the light that people will see of the God who created us. So we are, in essence, a response to what God has done. We are a reflection of what God is doing. When we think of it that way, we understand that we, as a Christian, as a child of God, are asked to be a reflection of God. In the book of Ephesians this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, being a reflection of Jesus Christ, it's our goal that the world would see our good deeds and praise God. We are to, we're not to hide our light under a bowl, but to put it in its stand instead so that everyone in the house can find direction. In Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10 this morning, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, notice these words. For we are God's workmanship... Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That verse in Scripture, I sometimes feel sorry for Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. Because sometimes we leave it off. 
We, we know Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. In fact, many of us probably know that by heart. It's for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We, we memorize that verse and we stop at verse 9 and sometimes we don't go so far as to remember verse 10. Verse 8 and 9 says it's God's grace. As we talk about, as Larry's saying, there's nothing that we do that merits God's love upon us, but God loves us unconditionally because he wants to. He gives us grace. It's by grace that we've been saved. Well, how? Through faith, through your faith, through my faith, by our response to God's grace and our belief and our reception of what God has done for us, our faith, grace and faith equals to our salvation. It's not anything that we've done. We can't boast about it. It's a gift from God. But verse 10 continues and it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So really there's kind of a little formula. You see it in front of you already. God's grace plus our faith really equals salvation. God has graced us in our faith. We're saved by that. We are saved by faith through God's grace. But we also understand that our salvation then also equals to good works. We ought to have good works in our life as a follower of Jesus. Good works don't create us to be a follower of Jesus. But by being a follower of Jesus, we ought to have good works in our life. We could most correctly say this morning, if we are not living a life of good works, we have no reason to believe that we have been saved by faith. If we don't live a life of good works, then we have no reason to believe that we've been saved by grace. When you look at your life and the result of your life, if you can't find good works, if others don't see good works coming from you, you have to ask yourself the question, have you been saved by grace? If you've been saved by grace through faith, then you ought to have good works because God has already prepared in advance that we should walk in those good works. Anything that is right in us does not bring grace to us, but instead is a result of grace that is in us. We don't do good things in order for grace to come our way, but because grace has come our way, we do good things. We do good things. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. When a Christian gets squeezed, when a child of God gets squeezed, what ought to ooze out, what ought to come out, what ought to be radiating from us is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those things are the fruit of the Spirit, and that's what should be coming out of us as followers of Christ. John Calvin wrote, It is faith alone that justifies, but faith that justifies can never be alone. It's faith alone that brings us to Jesus, but faith that brings us to Jesus has something attached to it on the tail end of it. And what it is, what's attached to it is Good works. We've been called to have good works. What good in James, what good does it do, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith? And uh, what good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can that kind of a faith save him? If there's nothing that's a byproduct of the faith that a person has, then can they really say that that faith really has saved them? James goes on to say, Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by what you see, by what I do. So there's something attached to our faith that is a a carrier, that is a byproduct of our faith, and that is good works. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance that we should do them. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Faith without works is useless. Rich Mullins wrote a song several years ago. 
And one of the lines in the song is, Faith without works is like a song you can't sing. It's as useless as a, sub, as a screen door on a submarine. You get the idea? What a word picture, right? Faith without works is like a song you can't sing. It's as useless as a screen door. on a. If we say we have faith, then we must produce works. It's not something that we generate on our own. It's what the Lord is generating in us when we allow him to have control. Faith works. I mean, faith without works is useless. God cannot work in us until he works for us. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this. God cannot work in me and in you until we first of all recognize that God has worked for me and for you. And how did he work for me and for you? He did that work in Jesus at the cross. So God has done his part. God has bestowed his grace. And once he bestows his grace, then we have the response that we can either believe or not believe. And if we believe and we exercise faith, then it ought to produce good works. God cannot work in us until he has worked for us. But God also will not work through us until he has worked in us. So God is at work around us. He's at work in us. He's at work through us. We're continually reminded that that it's God who's at work in us both to will and to act according to his good purpose in Philippians chapter 2, 13, and then Philippians chapter 1, 6, Scripture says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God is working in us, and we're so grateful for that. But that work that he's producing in us is also producing good works along the way. We are not saved by faith plus good works, but by a faith that works. A faith that works. When we stop to think about what this, our text is telling us today, have you ever been in a human library? You may not have ever thought about those two words before, but you probably have been in a book library before. You've been in a place where you walk in and there are books all over the place, and you can read anything you want to read. There are people who have written, book, written books and there are magazines and short stories and all kinds of things that you can go and read in a, in a library of books If you've never been in a human library, you're a liar. Because today, you're in a human library. Today is a human library. When we think about the words that our text tells us today, first of all, we are God's workmanship. Workmanship, what does that mean? The word workmanship means poem. You are God's poem. So as you look down your row this morning, and you look in front of you, and you look behind you, and those in the balcony, we look up there, and you look down here, we are looking around, and we are seeing God's poems everywhere. God's workmanship. You are God's story. You are God's poem, and he's created in you something that he wants to share with everybody else. So we today are in a human library. Now, here's the problem we have today. The problem is that we have figured out that we can improve upon God's writing. We think that God has given me this poem, but yet if I can take what I know today with what God started, then surely the end result is going to be better, right? We take God's poems and we want to erase a few of the words and put in our own words. Or we don't like this part, so we cut that part of the poem off. Instead of recognizing that you are God's workmanship, you are God's poems. The only thing that we have added to God's poem in reality is when we add anything at all, is that we've added sin to God's poem. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve decided that they could do it themselves, that they didn't need to follow God anymore, when they realized they could write on their own poem a better thought than what God had written on their poem, they sinned, they disobeyed God, they went their own way, there was consequences because of that. We do exactly the same thing. When we write on our own life, our own part, instead of recognizing that God has given us everything we need to live for him and to live in this world, God's grace Our faith, yes, salvation. God's grace, our faith, yes, good works. Poems, we are his workmanship. 
workmanship. When we recognize God's goodness, then we will be able to show our goodness. All Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, in writing on their own poem, was confuse the situation. And we're still trying to recover from it today. You are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship. Secondly, created in Christ Jesus. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are created to have a relationship with God through Christ. In the Old Testament, you read it over and over and over again, that when the Israelites followed God and obeyed him, they enjoyed the benefits of that relationship. When the Israelites disobeyed God and rebelled from his teachings, you see that God brought disciplines into their life to bring them back into a right relationship. So in the Old Testament, we see God desiring a relationship, God providing for a relationship. And as long as they were obedient and they followed, they enjoyed the benefits of that relationship. When they rebelled, they were brought into discipline to bring back that right relationship. In our relationship with God through Christ, God has put into our life good works, works that we're to do. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Jesus says these words, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are are his very own, listen to this, eager to do what is right. Part of your redemption is God putting in you Jesus' identity because you're his very own, but also that you have a desire to do what is right. So when we think of grace plus faith equal good works, a tree is created for its fruit. This past year, so many of our friends did not come to Fredericksburg this year or in the area because the peaches didn't make it. But when you look at a peach tree, what do you expect to come from the peach tree? Peaches. When you see an orange tree, what do you expect to be on the orange tree? Oranges. When you see an apple tree, what do you expect to be on the apple tree? Apples. When you see a pecan tree, what do you expect? Pecans. A tree is created for its fruit. The world has a right to expect from Christians good works, good things, because that's who God has created us to be in Christ. We're his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. And number three, we're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It doesn't make sense to me, and I don't understand it because I am linear. We are all linear. Everything that we know in life has had a beginning and an end. But that's not the way God is. His ways are different than our ways. They're much higher than our ways. God's timetable is his own, and his timetable is ahead of us. God knows what's going to happen this afternoon before we do. God knows what's going to happen this year before we do. God knows what's going to happen at the end of our life before we do. That's just who he is. God's timetable is not our... He has prepared in advance these works, these good works that we're to do. God knows the future because he plans it and then he creates it and then he brings it about. In creation, God created And he said it was very good. In fact, he says it was very good. And in his preparation, he plans, and what he planned also from the very beginning of time, that when we come to know Christ, that we would produce in our lives good works. God's advanced planning is throughout the Bible. You see it in the Old Testament. You see it through the New Testament. God is not frantically working behind the scenes to bring about his plan because of all the curveballs that Satan's throwing at him. No, God's plan is sure. And it's just. And in the end, it's going to be exact the way God, exactly the way God wants it. His plan was in place before God spoke anything into existence, before the creation of the world. God did not have to rethink something to bring Adam and Eve back into a relation because God knew that they were going to choose to go their own way. And God knew he would provide for them in Jesus' son. God knew he would send Jesus to die on the cross for the world. Before the foundations of the world were created... Jesus hung on a cross. God knew that was the reason. God knew that was the purpose. And that's why the Old Testament points to that. That's why in the New Testament we speak of that. And that's why today we are trying to share that with people so that we can be with him. Good works. Who can do them? Who can do good works? 
When we stop and think about good works, we think about uh, the aspect of what we're doing with our state missions offering. You heard Pudi Sot talk today in a testimony about how we as Texas Baptists were able to help her find Jesus. And not only help her find Jesus, but also to become a campus missionary. When, when we give the good works that we do as a group called Texas Baptist here in Texas, we're able to do more together than any of us can do by ourselves. And where does that money go? Well, that money goes to produce some things that you saw in Pootie's life. You saw her be able to understand that she was a child of God, even though she came as an atheist. You saw her not only begin to understand her salvation, but begin to share that with other students. Because we give their campus missionaries on our college campuses telling people about Jesus. Because you give, there are uh, all kinds of ministries taking place. There are prison ministries taking place, restorative justice taking place, all kinds of criminal justice taking place because of the gifts that we can give through to reach the students and the people and the prisoners and everybody, offenders, here in the state of Texas. I don't know if you're aware of this, but just a couple of years ago, they were fixing to pull every single chaplain out of our prison system because the state didn't have money to provide for them anymore. They thought they could spend the money more wisely by spending and building more prisons. Do you know it was who it was that got in arms? It was Texas Baptist. And it was some people who got together in Austin in our Christian Life Commission. They went down and let them know, do you understand what you're saying? This is what it's going to cost for you to take a person out of prison, put them on the streets, and not have them rehabilitated and go back in. This is the cost that it does that. And this is what the cost is to keep a chaplain in a prison trying to help somebody rehabilitate them so that when they go out, they don't come back. And when they saw the two, it was millions of dollars to pennies. But it was because of the offerings that we give to people who could go down and fight on our behalf that that's still in place. Today, there are still chaplains in our prison systems because of Texas Baptists. A lot of other people rallied around that, other ways to do it. Special Friends Retreat. You're going to read about Special Friends Retreat today during your prayer guide. In the Special Friends Retreat, that's a place and a time for, for people to come together who have mentally challenged, who are special, have special needs, and they come together like anybody else, and they get to have fun and play games and have someone tell them about God and let them be together in community. That happens because of the money that we give through Texas Missions Offering. We see small church grants. Did you know that there are churches today that have been a church for more than five years but have less than 100 members? And they want to do what we did. They want to help. They want to make some new carpet. They want to put a new tile. They want to help their building be better so they can reach more people, but they just don't have the money. Baptist General Convention of Texas has a grant that helps churches like that to be able to help them do what we're doing in our own area, in our own place. We see those things take place. We see college students who go, go now on missions. We have several people in our church that if you know them, uh, the Bowles this morning in our 830 service, they met after both of them had been on summer missions as BSM missionaries. The BSM missions in the summer, they take students and put them in different places. What a great work we're doing together. What a great work people are parted to. Grace plus faith equal good works. People are taking advantage of the good works because God has put that in us in advance of us even doing it. Those things are taking place because of the result that we have together, of joining together to do what we are. We do more together than any one of us can do by ourselves, fulfilling the Great Commission. When commuters become consumers, we get customers, but not disciples. When commuters become consumers, we get customers and not disciples. When we think about that in the church, Greg Laurie made that statement. When we think about that in the church, what he's saying is this, when the people who come to church, come to church only to, to consume, only to give it to me, only to give to me, only to fill my need. This is what I want. Make me happy. When we get that, you get a customer. And you'll only have a customer as long as they like you. And there are many churches today that are after customers because it's all about consumption. That's not who we are. We're about disciples. We're about becoming a disciple and making more disciples. Are we concerned with what people get? Yes. Are we trying to have the best quality we can? Yes. But when, consume, when commuters become consumers, we get customers and not disciples. We will always understand that we are most like Jesus when we find ourselves serving. 
When you're serving, you find yourselves to be most like Jesus in this world. We purposefully join with other Baptists in the state of Texas to bring the hope that we find in Christ and the joy that we find in serving. Pastors, you know, sometimes tell stories. One pastor told a story that I identify with because I think it would maybe something I might have done in our own Bible study classes. This pastor was walking around before worship service in the Bible study class, and he'd made his way to the preschool area. And in the preschool area, if you haven't figured this out, they get cookies and punch. So if, if you want to volunteer for cookies and punch, you got to volunteer in the preschool area if you need that on Sunday morning. Well, the pastor had gotten there a little bit after all the preschoolers had gotten their cookie. And as I probably would do, and as he did, he went around to the first little girl, and he acted like he's going to reach for that cookie. And what, what did she do? What did she, she pulled it back, right? This is my cookie. Well, he kind of teased, went to the next one, and they did the same thing. And he went all around the room doing the same thing. He got to the very last girl, and when he reached out for that last little cookie, she had seen him go all around the circle, and she went like this and gave her his cookie. That's good deed, that's when you see a need or what you see a need. Even in a preschooler, preschoolers can do good things and teach us good things. Who has a cookie that we can share? What do you have that you can share? Lydia is a, a lady who, who loved to give things away. She, she loved to, to make baked goods. And when she made baked goods, she made several plates. She didn't just make one, she made several because she made some for her neighbors uh, she made some for people who were in the hospital. Uh, she just did as much as she could because she enjoyed giving to people because she saw that it encouraged them. One garage sale she had gone to, she found a dollar's worth of figurines, ugly, messy, greasy figurines that she bought for a dollar. She took them home, and she took a toothbrush, and she cleaned them all up. And then she glued each figurine onto a three-by-five card, and she wrote something on the cards. On the card with a little bird, she wrote, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Placing a sheep on a card, she wrote, The Lord is my shepherd. One figurine was an armadillo, and on that card she wrote, Put on the whole armor of God. One figurine was, uh, had a figure of a pink and purple mouse dressed in a red bow tie and a rainbow colored top hat. And she wrote, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. She greatly enjoyed the project of giving to people because she saw that it encouraged them. But even more than doing it, she thought about them because she had somebody in mind when she made each one of those little cards. The zebra was for the nurse who cared for her aunt. The lion was for the man who lived alone in the house behind her. The turtle was for the little boy at the church who broke his leg. And as she delivered those figurines, she loved to do so because she encouraged them all the time. <clears throat> One day, she, she, uh, after she delivered the figurines, Lydia was surprised to see at her door Mr. Lyons. He's the man who lives beside, behind her all by himself. She'd given the lion to him. He handed her a little box which contained a beautifully carved teakwood dove, smooth, intricately detailed, right down to the feathers and the compassionate eyes. And Lydia's eyes widened. Oh, Mr. Lyons, this is beautiful. Where did you find this? And Mr. Lyons repeated, inside a piece of wood. Of course, I had to whittle away some of the wood to find it. And said, then Lydia said, I'm so overwhelmed. This is so beautiful and such a part of you. I don't know what to say. I gave you so little and you gave me so much. How can I ever thank you? <clears throat> Mr. Lyons said, you already have. This is my gift to you. Your gratitude is your gift to me. They're not dependent on each other. They're both gifts. Like, the God, like God's gift of grace and our gifts of gratitude. He smiled, excused himself, and he returned home. And Lydia wiped the tear from her eye. And as she turned to walk toward her table, she noticed that Mr. Lyons had also put in a card in with this little dove. And in the card were these words. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good deeds that God has prepared in advance for you to do. This morning, who has a cookie to give? 
Who has a cookie to share? Who has something good that you can do? Who has good in your life that you can give away? Well, the answer really is all of us. We all do. For all of us who know Jesus in our life as our Lord and Savior, we have good that we can do. And we're called upon to do that good. Everyone can share. Everyone can pray. Everyone can give. And everyone can go. It may not be across the waters. It may be next door. But we can all do those good things because God has put those good things in us when he put Jesus in us. This morning, we're going to have a time of response as we do every Sunday. And let me, let me share again with you that this next five minutes, this next ten minutes, this is the most important thing that we'll do today. It's more important than, than, than anything we've, 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 att- we've attempted today. It's more important than the sermon. It's more important than our worship. It's more because now is the time that people get a chance to respond to what God is wanting us to do as a church. To respond to what God is wanting us to do as a people. So I want to ask all of you to be in response this morning in this way. Some of you may be here and you've never confessed Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior. Today's the day that you can do that. Some of you may be here looking for a faith family, a family to belong to. This can be your family as we work in our community and around the world. There may be others here that that's not your call and that's not what God is speaking to you. Well, then God is asking you to do this. Everyone here, God is asking us to pray for the responses that need to be made. And some of those responses are going to be made public. It is time for us as a church to begin to pray for our community. And now is the time to do that. And you can most definitely do that in the balcony and sitting in your seats. But I want to call you this morning and from now forever until Jesus comes to come and pray down at the altar. To come and be a part of what we're doing as a faith family right here and to come and pray. Walk past these ministers unless you need to speak with one of them. And come and pray with us as we pray for Kerrville and as we pray for Texas. And as we pray for what God is wanting us to do around the world. That's who we are. That's what we need to be. Those are the good deeds that God has put in us. May we be faithful to what God is asking. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the good that you've put in us. Thank you for the grace that you've bestowed upon us and even the ability to place our faith in you. But Lord, help us to recognize that you are asking us to do good things. And may we, in your spirit and in your power, do them. Father, I pray that those who are here today that need to confess you in their life as Lord and Savior, that they will come and do that today. I pray that those who are thinking about joining a faith family, joining this church, that they will come and do that today. Others who will come forward and pray for the community and pray for the needs of our church and pray for the physical needs that they may have to do that, Lord, today. We give ourselves to you. We give ourselves to this time. We pray that you'll use it to make us the people that you want us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
place today. Let's go as his craftsmanship, his workmanship, as people who are hungry and found food tell those that are out there where they found it. Let's take care of somebody's hand and we're going to close by singing the chorus, that first song, Nothing But the Blood. <laughs> 